What's the word, y'all? Yeah, we saying that Sundays are no longer for football, but instead it's for the Kenny Beecham ramble about basketball and other stuff, because there will be other stuff in this one. I just remember I'm wearing a Homer Simpson shirt, um, and I know there's a percentage of people that clicked on this video, saw my shirt, and was like, nah, I can't take him seriously today. And I respect it, but, but the Simpsons have been such a big part of my life um, that I collect vintage Simpsons shirts. So today's video, this ramble, is going to be about some of the teams that I don't talk about as much as others because as you know as the season goes on some teams get little light whether it be because they're tanking or because they're not playing great basketball they we just don't talk about certain teams after maybe the first couple of days of basketball and i want to i want to circle back and talk about some of those scenes because right now as a youtuber i'm speaking for only myself but i'm assuming that other nba youtubers are going through this we don't really have a formula this season and i think that's partially due to the fact that there's parody in basketball the, the only formula that guarantees you a high performing video is when you talk about the Lakers and if you look through the channel on this season I think I've talked about the Lakers twice as far as thumbnails go maybe it was even once um, because like yesterday I dropped a video about the Boston Celtics they are 15 and 4 they have one of the biggest most loyal fan bases in basketball and yet that video was a 10 out of 10 and for people that aren't in tune with YouTube that means out of the last 10 videos I published on this channel that's the one y'all cared about the least Again, there's no formula. So let's talk about the weaker teams or the teams that I thought nobody cared about because maybe that is the real formula. And I want to start off with the Houston Rockets. I made it a goal with today only having a four-game slate. So I watch the entirety of the Houston Rockets game. They played yesterday against the Atlanta Hawks, and that one got chippy. Even today on Instagram and Twitter, people are throwing shots. Players are throwing shots at each other, and I love it. Um, Kevin Porter Jr. put something in his Instagram story about Trey Young, and Trey Young put out a Jay-Z quote. That blew my mind because, I mean, I've watched that video and from my interpretation of the scuffle and the antics that happened in that game, Trey Young and DeJounte Murray started it. So the fact that Trey Young goes and go onto Twitter and, and put out this tweet from, from Jay-Z, this quote from Jay-Z is just funny because A, y'all seem like y'all started it and B, you lost to the second youngest team in basketball who at that point had, what, three wins on the season? I don't know, bro. I think you just got to take that on the chin and just go to the next game, dog. You got to hope you see them again later in the season. You bust their ass because they just made you look foolish being up by 16 points and you losing to them. Um, so I watched that game yesterday. But again, it was one of those days where like eight games started at the same time. So though I watched, it didn't have my full attention. But today they played against the OKC Thunder. And it was like an even playing field. We had the youngest team in basketball, the OKC Thunder versus the second youngest team in basketball. And the only reason the Houston Rockets are the second youngest team and not the youngest team is because they have Boban on the roster, who's 30 plus. Boban don't goddamn play. So, I mean, th they're pretty similar when it comes to these ages. You know what I'm saying? And both of them are coming off a back to or going into a back to back. Both of them are coming off wins. It felt like the perfect game to watch. And you know what? It was interesting. Um, the last couple games, Jabari Smith Jr., I said on Twitter he turned the corner. I should have said he's turning the corner because I don't want to say that off three games. But in the last three games, he's been phenomenal. In the first six or so minutes of this one, he was being pretty dominant in a sense when it came to the defensive side of the ball, which is great. And his jump shot was falling, and he was getting my rebound. Shout out to him because he made me some money tonight. It was at seven and a half rebounds. He ended with 13. Thank you for that. Um, but, but early on our podcast today, one of the questions that we got asked by, ooh, Space Cadet Houston. Space Cadet Houston, I don't know if you watch these videos too, but I remember your name. He asked about building culture in the play style because, again, he is a Houston Rockets fan, and he, he was a little bit worried about the lack of culture and play style with this roster. And, you know, I'm on the podcast with three other people, so, like, I be having thoughts, but I like temper them because I'm sharing the platform with other people and I don't want to talk for 15 minutes about my personal opinion when I got other people that also want to give theirs. So I gave an answer, but I've also been thinking about this quite a bit recently because the Houston Rockets are one of those teams that like if I'm looking at the tanking teams, they don't really have an identity just yet. They're still building that. And they got me thinking about how do you A, implement and B, grow culture on a team um, because by all accounts from anybody I've asked about culture, any any podcast I've listened to where an NBA player was asked about culture, they talk about it being, if not the most important thing in the locker room, the the one of the most important things. Like Tyrese on JJ's show said that it has been the most important thing to the Indiana Pacers success. He said that in the last couple seasons when he played in Sacramento, there was a lack of culture and you felt that and now he's an Indian. Boom, they build, they're building it and they got it. So the Houston Rockets have been towards the bottom of the standings for two years and running 
and they haven't really figured out who exactly they are going to be soon with some of the other teams that are considered tanking you kind of have an idea again the Pistons don't necessarily have a culture I mean they win in five games Orlando Magic don't necessarily have a culture but like they have what seems like the crumbs of what could turn into it and the Houston Rockets kind of lack that in this moment the Rockets are going to go into their third year in a row where they're going to be towards the bottom of the standings third year in a row they're going to end up with like a top five pick which is cool but I'm trying to think about teams that were on the same path and the first team that came to mind was the Phoenix Suns the Phoenix Suns went through year after year after year of lottery team high lottery pick Josh Jackson Dragon Bender Marquise Chris same draft class but so on and so forth they continued to be sort of the bottom of the lottery they ended up getting the first overall pick of DeAndre Aiden and you can argue that at that point as they continue to lose and lose and lose and lose they had no culture at all and then something changed they got to the bubble a place that a lot of people, including myself, thought they had no business being. They went undefeated, and they traded for a guy that brings culture. Now, I'm not saying that everything that the Phoenix Suns have built over the last couple of seasons is because Chris Paul. I'm not going to go on that, even though Chris Paul is my guy. But obviously, bringing in those veterans into the locker room played a huge, huge part in them building and starting their culture. And with the Houston Rockets, we mentioned they're the second youngest team in basketball because Bobby's 30. They have no vets that play basketball other than Eric Gordon. And every Houston Rocket fan that I follow, not they don't hate Eric Gordon, but they're tired of the Eric Gordon minutes. And I'm not saying that he should be playing just because he is a vet. I mean, if you, if you ain't really that guy, you ain't really that guy, but they are lacking that. And I would hope for the sake of their organization, with this being the third year of them being towards the bottom of the conference, that they go out there and start to sign people or find people that can implement this because it's hard i'm trying to figure out exactly exactly what i want to say it, it's hard for jalen green to teach himself it's hard for uh, kevin porter jr all of these dudes who have only been in the league for a few seasons that don't really know the ropes to teach themselves what it means to be a winning basketball player in the nba and i don't know eric gordon personally i don't think i've ever heard eric gordon speak a word so i don't know exactly what he's like in the locker room but basically right now the only veteran voice they have is him and bobby giving out hugs to the teammates but i believe this is a very very important draft for them obviously they would love to have vic but i think if they don't end up with vic this is is so so goddamn goddamn crucial Jalen Green looks like an absolute stud and today I saw some playmaking vision that I haven't really seen in him and you would hope that that starts to progress more and more every single year that he's playing the game of basketball like I mentioned Jabari Smith Jr. starting to turn that corner Alperin Sengun they have a lot of young talented intriguing pieces but they need to figure it all out together and I think this is that draft class where you could potentially get that last piece to now we start to care about not just not just being in games and losing but turning it over to the point where we're, we're winning games i don't think based on who they draft this season they're going to immediately be a playoff team but they should start to really out go out there and start to to, to win more basketball games at the end of the day and one thing i lacked him i didn't mention when i was referencing the phoenix suns when it came to building culture was a coaching job was a coaching job they went into this bubble right they went into the bubble and I, re I vividly remember a a Monty Williams speech okay maybe it's not vividly because vividly makes it seem like I would know the words to it. I don't but I remember him having a a speech that I watched I watched at the crib we in the bubble so everybody's at the crib and I'm like damn I will run through a wall for this man Monty he cried after they went eight no y'all like he's he is a guy that came in and changed things because the year before he got there they won 19 games the year before that they won 21 they won 24 they won 23 and then they got to the bubble 134 and then the season after that they were the number one seed in basketball they got to the finals then they were the number one seed in basketball got it got you know embarrassing the game seven to luka and the, and the guys but you get what i'm saying and even right now the guy that i i talked about as being the guy that they traded for that mattered a bunch chris paul hasn't played much this season and here they are they're still winning a bunch of basketball games i i, I failed to mention devin booker as well because he was on a lot of these bad teams but he ain't hang his head he knew eventually there will be a brighter time and i think and i'm only doing i'm not saying based on play styles or yeah i'm just saying uh, th this could be jalen green could be their devin booker he could be 
They just need more pieces. That's all. So, um, and I don't know much about Steven Silas. I do know he's a passionate ass coach where he's crying at the podium because of Kevin Porter Jr. is doing some things and stuff. So he's a passionate, passionate coach. But I think a coach's voice can only go so far without a secondary coach, somebody else that can that can relay that message to the players as a player. And they need to get that. So I, I think the Houston Rockets' future is still extremely bright, even though, again, they're, they're failing to win a bunch of games. But what I saw today was intriguing. It was very intriguing. Now, last year, they did go on a nine-game win streak in the middle of the season. Y'all remember that? Um, so that was that was an interesting time. Maybe they're about to do that again. I know. I'm going to talk about the Lakers. I said earlier that I might talk about the Lakers. But I, I, this is weird because I wanted to talk about Anthony Davis, and then he didn't play tonight, so it's not extremely topical. But the play that we've got recently from Anthony Davis brings me so much joy. When he played with the New Orleans Pelicans, bro, he was legitimately one of my favorite individual players to watch. Um, the series they had against the Portland Trailblazers where Drew Holiday and Rajon Rondo put the clamps on Dame and CJ was magnificent when Anthony Davis doing his thing. It seemed like no matter what, you could turn on a Pelicans game and Anthony Davis was doing something spectacular. And though he's not back to that because he's doing it differently. I ain't got the numbers or the proof to, to say this. But the stretch that he recently was on before he sat out, only a second game he's missed so far on the season, which is great numbers for Anthony Davis. Um, he's doing it differently. Again, I don't have the numbers, but when I watched him play with the Pelicans, he was inside and out, meaning that he had the mid-range jump shot. You know, he was doing a lot of that. But now with the Lakers, it's been extremely inside, at least in the games that, that LeBron wasn't there. And I was... I was excited about that because he had been the guy over the last couple of seasons with the Lakers where he felt like he didn't want to take a lot of contact. He didn't want to go down low and be with the big dogs. He didn't want to play center. He told the world, I would rather play four because I don't, well, he ain't say the because part, but I would rather play four. Uh, they know I'd rather play four, but I'm going to do whatever the team takes. And in these last, I don't know how many games it was, but he is down there with the big dogs. 20, 20 games, 38 points, 20 rebounds, like this is the AD we knew and we wanted. This is the version of AD that everybody was saying LeBron was going to give the keys to. He's maybe here. He's maybe here. Now, the rest of the roster is still dog, but, like, he's he's here. And this, if we could get this version, now obviously, I need to see them do this together. But the first game, LeBron James was back. LeBron didn't look as great, but Anthony Davis still looked good. And AD has to figure out how he can still be the dominant force that he was and the X amount of games that LeBron missed while LeBron is on the court because that puts them in a position to win almost any game even if the the rest of the supporting cast ain't very good and man he he made though that Lakers stretch very watchable um and, and like I was watching Lakers not because I wanted to but because they're the talking basketball but when he was doing his thing it was like oh snap AD and he wasn't doing nothing spectacular when it came to like visually I'm gonna give me a rebound I'll dunk I'll do a layup. I'll do a spin hook. Like, it wasn't aesthetically pleasing by any means. But he got that work done. And if AD could turn into that player, whoo, you love to see. Remember, this is a guy that people voted on one of the 75, 76 best players in the history of basketball, man. And in the last season or so, it was hard to back that up. But if we could get that stretch again, boy, oh, boy, is it going to be exciting. The Utah Jazz are 3-7 and seven in their last 10. Um, I made a video on this channel that was like, this video will not, um, what did I say? This video would not jinx the Utah Jazz. I'm going to be honest with you. I made that video knowing damn well that the Utah Jazz were not about to be the number one seed in basketball. Spoiler alert. I knew you probably knew that too. Um, but they are down to the eighth seed at 12 and 10. And you know what blows my mind the most about this? It's, it's very selfish what I'm about to say. In my fantasy league, I tried my damnedest to sell Larry Marketing while he was at the peak of his powers. Oh, I tried to finesse. There was a trade that I had drew up that was, uh, oh, it was Julius Randle. It was Julius Randle, uh, Larry Marketing for Car Anthony Towns and another wing that was like, it was a starter wing that's okay. I don't remember who it was. And, and bro was very close to accepting that trade. Didn't. He was a little bit afraid of Larry. But I, he was close, bro. He was so close. I could have had Car Anthony Towns in my roster right now. Um, either way, yeah, they, they come back down to earth. And today, the game against the Suns may have showed that they're they're doing it by design. Or maybe it was just complete brain fart by rookie coach Will Hardy. I don't really know. 
but it was a what one point game or so a shot clock difference and a game clock difference like two seconds but instead of fouling with 10 seconds to go they they tried to play it out which means that if they if the suns missed the shot and the the jazz got a rebound at the most they would have had two seconds to figure something out that's at the most that's that's if the the rebound was perfectly put in kelly olenic's hands and it wasn't tipped around or nothing guess what balls tipped around deandre Aiden got a board and it was over instead of fouling and twitter was talking like hmm is will hardy a fraud 12 uh, 22 games into his nba coaching career or they pull the plug and that that doesn't seem like that mix up doesn't seem like something that happens with a real nba coach by accident maybe i'm mistaken i'm giving will hardy the benefit of the doubt and saying that this is the turn right now mike conley is out it's the perfect time for the turn to happen and me and the guys talked about this and and we were talking about them and the indiana pacers um, them and the Indiana Pacers for the similar reasons why I talked about in my video that the Indiana Pacers had an, a difficult decision to make. And in that video, I said, hey, you got Tyrese Halliburton, who is a building stone, who's going to be a, I don't know how many time all-star. He damn near about to make it this season. You got Benedict Mather, who looks like a stud, who eventually that will be your backcourt of the future. You have a couple building pieces, so you don't need to tank to the bottom for Wimby because you have those two pieces. And as long as you draft well, that might be good enough. Now, I, I got some pushback on that from Indiana the Pacers fans that that think that they should go deeper into the tank which I completely understand because the Indiana Pacers have been good to solid for the entirety of my lifetime they never did the tank into the absolute bottom in my lifetime they've always been good enough to make the playoffs but never good enough to make the finals and they're saying hey if we don't get one of those top superstar players we'll never be that team and I understand um but I, I was hesitant to say that the Utah Jazz to take a similar approach because Looking at their 15-man roster, there's some intriguing pieces over there for sure. But who do you think on that roster would you consider a building block? It's not many. Lowry's been playing really good this season. He not. I don't think what he's doing right now gets him to constitute as a building block for the future. So in their eyes, at least I think in their eyes, they're like, man, we got, we kind of got to. We, we kind of got to do what we got to do. And, yeah, we're way ahead of the Houston Rockets, the Denver – nope, not the Denver Rockets, the Detroit Pistons and the Orlando Magic. We're way ahead of them. But we still need to do something to get towards this bottom because, boy, oh, boy, having a 7% chance is a lot better than having a 1.2% chance or having no chance at all if we keep our playoff hopes alive. So I don't know if exactly that's what they're thinking, but that's, that's going to be my guess just because there's no way Will Hardy did not tell his boys to foul. There's no way – whatsoever but the crazy thing about all of this in the nba season so far is that the parody is actually real and it's it's fun because every single night you can get any kind of result like i love that as a as a guy that watches basketball every single night for a living but it does again as a youtuber selfishly speaking make it just a little bit tougher to figure out who the hell to talk about and why i mean the difference between the one seed and the 11th seed in the West is three and a half games. The difference between the three seed and the 11th seed is one and a half games, y'all. Like, we're a quarter of the way through the season and nobody's running away with nothing. Nothing at all. And last season, it felt like there was definitely people running. I mean, the, the Suns won, what, 60-something games last season? So, we had teams at the top last season that were... Like, if they were playing that night, you were pretty confident they were going to win. And you don't have that. I mean, you can make an argument that the Boston Celtics are that, be a 9-1 in their last 10, and only four losses on the season. But other than that, every single team feels beatable. And that makes me think that this playoffs should be really, really good. I'm still in the back of my head just thinking about the idea that, that people were saying before the season that there's going to be a lot of teams that are willing to sell this this uh deadline because they want to get in on these sweepstakes but i'm looking like are the teams that will be selling the houston rockets don't have anything to sell because like i mentioned they're the second youngest team in basketball you can sell eric gordon i guess this has to be the year he gets traded but maybe not the spurs i can see the spurs selling off Jakob or josh richardson or doug mcdermott but they lose a hell of games with those dudes so i mean whatever the lakers aren't selling OKC is not selling because they're the youngest team in basketball. The Dallas Mavericks aren't going to be a seller, even though they're the Dallas Mavericks in a very interesting spot. I'm going to keep that in the back of my mind because I want to talk about Mavericks really, really quick after I talk about this. 
the the Warriors aren't selling. The Timberwolves just traded five first round picks. They aren't selling. The Jazz again could legitimately be sellers so right now based on what we said we got two teams that i think could be selling right now and that's going to be the spurs and that's going to be the jazz the clippers aren't selling they got Kawhi and paul george eventually hopefully maybe i don't fuck it nobody knows nobody knows the kings are not going to sell because this is the best they've looked in 16 years the trailblazers probably will not sell um their pick is lottery protected to the bulls but that's not enough to go deep into the tank because when damian lillard has played they live competent the the grizzlies the pelicans the nuggets and the suns those teams are not selling out east i could see bojan bagdad was getting traded again so i'll add three the orlando magic could technically be sellers to guys like i don't know Cole anthony could be on a different team or um, John Isaac, if some team wants to take a flyer on a $17 million contract of a guy that has not played basketball in three goddamn seasons. So I'll add them to my list, maybe, just because they have a lot of depth, but none of the depth is like elite. I truly, truly believe that the Charlotte Hornets need to be selling like hell. More than any team in basketball right now, the Charlotte Hornets need to sell, sell, sell. The, the ceiling for this roster, even with LaMelo Ball, is playing, and we've seen that. Uh, Gordon Hayward not getting you nothing because he he fired his original barber, and now he can't stay healthy, which has been the consistency throughout his career. Actually, I think his wife um, made comments about his injuries over the, the recent years and blamed the Charlotte Hornets for not taking care of their players which is interesting this interesting part of injuries that i never really thought about i just kind of thought about gordon hayward is the most unlucky player in the history of basketball but what 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 about the charlotte hornets staff but like does anybody else on their team go through crazy injuries it's literally just gordon like Lamelo has had injuries but there are freak accidents he stepped on the man's foot that was sitting courtside those are like freak accidents not like he's consistently been injured it, it, I mean, Gordon Hay was dealing with injuries before he got. So no, that ain't a Charlotte Hornets thing. Um, it's not a Charlotte Hornets thing. I don't know. I don't know. You can't blame them. Maybe you can blame him for a little bit, but no, nah, he's been there. The Bulls have a chance to potentially be sellers, but I'm not gonna put that out in the air just yet. What the hell is going on with the Bulls? Nobody knows. Um, the Heat not selling. The Brooklyn Nets. Could you see it? I'll be surprised, but I'm not counting it, counting it out completely. Um, as they just continue to just be eh. I know Ben Simmons has looked better and better every single game. And there's they're one of them teams where you want to give them more time before you make a dramatic decision. And luckily for them, um, luckily for them, they have until February. But unluckily, they don't have their own pick this season. So, like, if they do sell everything, what they, I mean, you're not getting your pick back. That goes to Houston, if I'm not mistaken, a part of the James Harden trade. The Knicks, the Knicks are one of those teams that I, I, I would like for the sake of their organization to be sellers. Is that harsh, Knicks fans? You, you tell me if I'm in the wrong here. But when I watch Knicks basketball, it's kind of uninspiring. I really like how Jalen Brunson has been playing recently. Um, he's He's been a revelation. Obviously, you gave him that money, and he's lived up to it, at least in my opinion. I tweeted that I didn't think he was overpaid, and people are like, Kenny, you bugging? But, like, he's getting paid with, like, the 16th highest paid point guard in basketball. I feel pretty confident saying that Jalen Brunson is around there in production. Could be wrong. I don't know who ahead of him. I don't know who beneath him. But based on that... I feel pretty good about saying that he's one of the 16th most productive point guards in basketball. But everything else is so uninspiring. <sighs> I don't like to make, like, talk bad about individual players because, obviously, a lot of things go deeper than basketball. R.J. Barrett has been... Oh, boy. Um, he's not even doing it on the defensive side of the ball to make up for it. I mean, I saw a stat this morning that he's missed like 70 of the last 110 shots, 70 something out of the last 110 shots. And it just hasn't been good. And I, you want to give him the benefit of the doubt because he is only 22, if I'm not mistaken, or around that age. But for a guy that just got paid the money that he did, this is the slowest slash worst start he could have potentially asked for, where no jump shot has fallen where he's getting to the basket and he's not finishing. And if you remember my video, I don't remember what exact, what video we were, we were talking about, but I said the next step in his development is A, finishing at the rim and B, finding out how the hell to pass out of drives because once he puts his head down, there's no stopping him. And right now I'm going to look, his accuracy at the rim is um, still 55% at the rim, which has been the same way for the entirety of his playoffs. So you're wondering if that's really good or really bad. 
um that is in the 28th percentile that same percentage was in the 15th percentile last season so uh not very good when it comes to his mid-range jump shot he's at 35 percent mid-range shooter that's a 41th percentile little less than league average still not very good three pointers in general general 27 percent six percentile obviously i ain't got to tell you that's god awful only people that are shooting worse from three right now is Isaac Okoro, Matisse Steibel, James Booknight. That's, you don't want to be in the company with these dudes. Not when it comes to shooting basketballs. You don't want to be in the company with those dudes. I'm sorry. That's just not, those are not the dudes you want to be messing around with. And when it comes to frequency, again, he gets to the basket better than a lot of people at basketball, but he doesn't convert when he's there. And his lack of vision hurts him a ton. Because if I'm guarding RJ Barrett or I'm teach or I'm coaching a team that that we're going against RJ Barrett, I know if he's getting to the basket, he has one thing in mind as to put it in the hole and not think otherwise. So I'm gonna tell my team that. That let's just let's just pack it in a little bit once we see him get that first step. I mean, if you look at his numbers, the defensive numbers are are awful. It's actually the one percentile. The one percentile, y'all. I mean, that's not all him. I'm looking at how bad the team is defensively when he's on the court. There's no, there's nobody in basketball that's worse for their team defensively when it comes to per, points given up per 100 possession than R.J. Barrett right now. I, I'm, I'm getting all of the stats that I look at, at to some extent. You have to not take them with a grain of salt, but you have to take them and, and interpret them as you may. I don't think he's the worst defensive player in basketball. Like that, st that stat is saying, hey, get his ass off the court because we can't defend a goddamn. Actually, I'm sorry. It's not just him. The worst when it came comes to these numbers is Tyus Jones. And then it's Julius Randle, RJ. But they share the court together more than almost any duo um, possible. So when they're on the court together, it, it, and we ain't getting no, we ain't getting no stops, ladies and gentlemen. We ain't getting no stops. That's not, it's not supposed to be a tangent about RJ Barrett, but I'm a little bit. Um, I would be upset if I'm a Knicks fan because this offseason you had a, a opportunity to make a big time decision to go one way or another and you didn't do either of those two things. Um, I mean, I know that the Cleveland Cavaliers came from underneath and swept Donovan Mitchell from underneath y'all feet, but it was there. It was there and you wouldn't have to be thinking about this RJ Barrett contract. You would have Donovan Mitchell who is helping the Cleveland Cavaliers be one of the best teams in basketball. So, um, yeah, that's... I mean, I think this offseason could be looked at as like a turning point in their organization, depending on what the hell they do this season. I mean, they said they want a first round pick for Emmanuel quickly. They're trying to sell a 23 year old guard. So I don't know exactly what what the cards hold for the Knicks, um, even though a lot of people want to see Tom Thibodeau's head on a stake. Um, the Washington Wizards are a team that I think could be sellers, but their ownership is so OK with being average that maybe they don't. They've been so okay for the history of me being a fan of basketball with just being an eye. Have they had a 50-win season in the history of their organization? I don't think the answer is yes. And if it is yes, it was in the 60s before the boys determined that Bullets was a not a good name for a team. You know what I'm saying? So it's been a long time, and the ownership is like, hell, Bradley, a lot of people buy Bradley Beal jerseys. We still in the playoff hunt. We chilling. But in reality, I think that the best thing for their organization is to finally take that that plunge because their history with drafting, when we talk about the 7th to 11th overall pick, has been eh. It's been, it's been eh. You know? They haven't... I, I, if I look at the Washington Wizards, there's, there's not a name on there that I think that in three years should be on the roster still as in like a building piece. You see Flash from Denny. Shout out to him. The defense is always there, but he doesn't shoot the basketball ever. That's why he got his spot taken by was Anthony Gill. He doesn't shoot. He's afraid to shoot the basketball. He's Ben Simmons light, but like not paid max money. So who cares? Rui Hachimura gives you flashes, but it's, it's you know, they got a lot of weird stuff. They got a lot of weird stuff over there. Porzingis has been good, but a lot of weird stuff. I mean, when I'm thinking about their roster. If they are going to be sellers, who's buying what they got? I would be hesitant if I'm any of the 29 teams out there to buy Bradley Beal. With that contract, like what team would be in the market for Bradley Beal? Can the Knicks say, hey, we missed out on Donovan Mitchell. Let's get Bradley Beal. That wouldn't satisf satisfy the, the fan base because they're smart NBA fans. They know the gap between what Donovan Mitchell could potentially get you and what Bradley Beal could get you is a big gap. No disrespect, Bradley. It's a big gap. That, that's what I think. 
Um, so what other team would even be interested in something like that? You know, the Miami Heat is always linked to star players, but do they want that when they already gave Jimmy Butler's big old contract, Duncan Robinson selling the books, they still got Tyler Hero on the books, they still got Bam Adebayo on the books. What team would look at Bradley Beal and say, yep, we're buying that right now? It's not a ton. The Dallas Mavericks have a case just because they might just want to pair Luka with somebody because right now, like today, perfect example of this, played against Toronto Raptors. Toronto Raptors missing Pascal Siakam. They're missing Scotty Barnes. They're missing hella people. Uh, Delano Banton is still out, which is like the X factor uh, for every NBA team. They, they're missing a lot of people. And the, the Mavericks come in, if I'm not mistaken, completely healthy. Maybe not, but completely healthy is what I want to say. And they lost because the Raptors decided to throw a double team at Luka anytime he touched the ball. Half court, throw a double team. We think Spencer Dean was a good player, but have him beat us. We think Christian Wood is a good player. Have him beat us. We'll 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 live with, with anybody else beating us and not Luka. And they just don't have it. Luka tonight played 30 or uh, 43 minutes of basketball. Guess what, y'all? His ass plays again in less than 24 hours. He plays today as y'all watching this video. He played 43 minutes against OG Ananobi and Thaddeus Young. His goddamn joints are in, are inflamed. And now he got to go play against Giannis and company on TV? You know, that's that's it's just not good, bro. It's just not good. And, and, and people always tell me, Kenny, we're better than our record shows. And I, you're probably right. You're probably right. The team that was in the conference finals last season. But there's a lot to be desired if Luka ain't able, in this case he wasn't, able to give you his normal 30. Somebody else got to step up, and they haven't had a ton of that this season. And and can you, with their contracts, could they convince themselves that, that Bradley Beal is the dude? Maybe. It ain't like they got a lot of draft capital to throw Washington, but maybe Washington don't even give a damn about draft capital. They just want to wash their hands. I don't know. I don't know. I'm always looking for fake trades, though. Fake trades are always fun. Never in the history of my life have I seen a fake trade that everybody agreed on. It just doesn't happen. But Bradley, I mean, um, Luka deserves a secondary guy. I don't know if it's Bradley. Actually, I would say that, no, it's not Bradley, if you were to ask me right now. But he will be an upgrade from a lot of the other stuff that they got right now. Upgrade, man, because boy, oh, boy. Um, and, and me and the guys talked about this as well in the podcast um, about the Luka Doncic problem. And it's not because of him because he's just too damn good. Where where Luka immediately comes into basketball and he is so good as a player that you don't have an opportunity to build through the draft, right? Let, let me go to the Dallas Mavericks record by year. Um, record by year this is what the ramble is by the way um it was supposed to be no cuts but i had the i had the hiccups earlier so what whatever so um at one point oh my god wait no wait wait is luca on this roster i'm sorry we rambling whatever 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 just give me the okay so this is rookie luca the year that that luca was a rookie by the way um dwight powell let them in and win shares i'm just saying if you look at the 12 greatest I'm sorry. I got. I got to show y'all this. I got to show y'all this because this is crazy. The 12 greatest, the 12 greatest Dallas Mavericks player of all time. It's Dirk. It's Blackman. Whatever. Dwight Powell is number 11 because for two years and then last year he led the team in in win shares. This is why I say stats don't tell you the whole story. Um, but that's absolutely insane. I'm sorry. Okay, it's absolutely insane. But. So Luka Doncic, the Dallas Mavericks win 24 games, end up getting Luka Doncic trade with the Atlanta Hawks, Trey Young goes to yada, yada, yada. And then immediately um, they go up to 33 wins. You're like, okay, that's not that big of a jump, but they jumped up nine total wins on a season. And then you get to the point where they make the playoffs, they make the playoffs, and they make the conference finals. They basically had one year post Luka where they were in the lottery. Just one year, y'all. Just one year since he was in the, in the league. And with the draft pick that they used, they drafted... I don't, I don't know who, right? So they didn't have the opportunity to do the traditional, um, to do the traditional rebuild where it's like, okay, we got a young player, Paolo Bancaro, for for, for just using him because he was the first overall pick this season. Paolo is an absolute stud, but we still gonna lose hella games this year, so we got the opportunity to pair him up with another absolute stud. But Luca is in the league of his own with him and LeBron and maybe some other people in history I can't think about where he 
in himself is automatically a playoff team as a rook or as a sophomore year player. So we don't have the season where we get Paolo Bencaro another top five draft pick. And, and I think because the years previously, the year pre-Luka, when they were in the lottery, they didn't take advantage of the lottery picks that they had. They drafted Dennis Smith Jr., who in his rookie season was pretty solid, but they found out very early on that they didn't really like the idea of him on the roster, and they shipped him off. And shout out to him for being back. Um, and they they just haven't been able to build through the draft post or pre him, and now it's going to be hard to do it post him. And we were trying to figure out how how do you do it now then? How do you do it now then? Because you look at the top teams in basketball. Let's let's get a good example. The Boston Celtics, you know, they had some down years. They had some years where they finessed other organizations, and that's how you get Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. Um, but they built through the draft. Marcus Smart is through the draft. The Jays are through the draft. Robert Williams is through the draft. The Bucks drafted Giannis 15, but it took Giannis, or 14, 15, whatever. It took the Bucks a few years post-drafting Giannis, and they had those other moves. But those other moves weren't necessarily through the draft. Yeah. The Bucs team isn't built through the draft necessarily. It's through buying in on players, buying low on players. They bought low on Brooke Lopez. They bought low on Chris Middleton. They paid for Drew, and it worked out. They won a championship. But that's one of the teams that they didn't do it through the draft, but instead, they, uh, that's, that's very interesting. Okay. Um, but like the Phoenix Suns, did it through the draft. Drafted Devin Booker, had a couple other bad years, and that's how you end up with Mikael Bridges. You get you end up with DeAndre Aiden, and then you do the trade. We talked about that already. The different Nuggets did it through the draft. Like, they don't have an opportunity, talking about the Dallas Mavericks again, to do it through the draft. So the guys are like, hey, Morgan's the entire future. Just do it. Lucas signed an extension, so you know you got him on the contract for the next couple seasons. But we're in the we're in the era of player empowerment, ladies and gentlemen. We're Lucas signed an ex- extension. Next season, he can say, ah. I'm done with Dallas. We doubt it. I'm not I'm not putting that out there. Knocking on wood for them. They got a generational player. You don't want him to ever be upset. But crazier things have happened. You know what I'm saying? Player empowerment is a crazy, crazy thing. Uh, the, the league offices are high-fiving each other because we locked this player up for a long time. Nope. Kevin Durant had four years left on his deal. He said, trade me or fire Steve Nash. They listened to him eventually. You know what I'm saying? Player empowerment is a crazy thing. So you, so the guys are like, hey, Morgan's the entire future. Because we want to just make sure that we get the... Because Luka right now is playing some elite level basketball. Let's be real. He's averaging 30 plus points per game. He's an MVP candidate every single season. He's an all-NBA first teamer. He's 24, if that. Like, he's been that goddamn good. Mortgage the future because the picks that we have, as long as Luka stays healthy and he doesn't have no crazy history and no injuries, as long as he stays healthy, those picks are 24, 25, 26. Throw them misses to somewhere else. Let's go buy in on somebody that we believe is the perfect fit from Luka. And they tried to do that very early in Luka's career. They went to go get Porzingis. And I thought in the moment, the Porzingis trade looked like a dub. They gave up some pieces. They gave up some draft capital. Porzingis a little stretched the floor, allowed Luka to get downhill if he wanted to. Boom. It didn't work. They sold Porzingis for practically nothing at last year's trade deadline. Not practically nothing. Especially then when he's damn near their second best player this season. So they they sold him for something that seemed like nothing in the moment. Because Spencer then was having a bad season in Washington. And that's how bad the experiment of Porzingis and Luka was. I don't know what it was like in the locker room, but on the court, it was a lot to be desired. So so I also do believe that Luka's one of those players in his young age. So, like, you, he might be, hmm, how do I say this without seeming like a jackass? He might be one of those players that's that you need the perfect co-star around him. You know how, like, some players are so good, or so not just good, but play style is so there that you can pair them with almost any other star in basketball and, and you think that they're going to be good Kevin Durant is the perfect portable star he's the perfect portable star where it don't matter if he got me and Edmund Sumner or Steph Curry and Klay Thompson he gonna get his and he gonna help that team be elite I don't know if Lucas on that level especially not in this in this young age I don't know if his portability if we talking about craft the NBA.com statistics or um yeah it's a statistic right I don't know if his portability is as high as what a Kevin Durant might be. So um, it's a very interesting place for the Dallas Mavericks to be. They should definitely, definitely be buyers. Whatever they end up doing, be buyers and just let things fall into place. Um, I don't know if I talked about anything right now. And I there's honestly three other topics I'm looking at that I should get to. 
but we're 40 minutes in this is basically turned into a podcast it wasn't the intention but that's what the ramble's about <laughs>